<laughs> Just like me saying, Aloha. <laughs> oh, I send wow. my alo- I send my aloha to you. <laughs> <laughs> Hey. Oh wow, that's that's amazing. Um, but I'm I'm happy to hear that. So as much as I was concerned for you know little you, uh, apparently there's a lot of beings looking after you, and hopefully for every child that's you know finds himself in that situation. Okay. Okay, so your your second your third inter, uh, in the <laughs> actually uh, let's throw back to the second. Uh, you wanted to hear about my friend Bruce, right? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah. So my second near death experience uh, occurred in, when I was in my uh, late twenties, and uh, <clears throat> a friend of mine. There was a teacher in Molokai. Uh, he, we used to go hunting and went to the same church. But uh, one night he was playing volleyball and he died of a stroke, massive stroke. And uh, he left behind a wife and four children. So um, it was a really sad occasion. And um, about a year later, after he passed away, uh, I went to Chicago, and uh, I was there for two weeks in the middle of winter, and I got double pneumonia. <laughs> and uh, when I came home, uh, I had high fever, couldn't breathe, and even though I was taking antibiotics, so I couldn't. Uh, I was having, I was struggling recovering, and so one night my temperature was just off the charts, and uh, I was feeling miserable and just didn't want to I, I di- didn't know how much longer I could handle this so I talked to my wife at the time I says you know I feel so bad I, I think I'm gonna die you know and she looks at me stop talking like that <laughs> so you know I kissed her good night and went into the bed uh, bedroom and uh, fell asleep and the next thing I know, um, I feel while I was sleeping, I felt someone pulling on my toe, <laughs> pulling on my toe. And so I jumped up in my bed and I looked at the uh, foot of my bed and there was my friend standing there. His name was Bruce. And he's standing there uh, wearing uh, blue coveralls because he was a shop teacher, yeah? <laughs> and uh, Blair wearing his blue cover, uh, blue coveralls, hair slicked back, and smiling. And I jumped out of bed and ran up to him and I hugged him and I said, "Oh, Bruce, you know, thank, thanks for coming. Oh, I haven't seen you in a long time. Where you been?" And all of a sudden, I realized, "Oh, this is my friend Bruce who died a year ago." <laughs> and I jumped back and I, "Bruce, you're dead, right?" And he's calling, smiling, he says, ah, I said, I don't put it that way. And so I realized that uh, I may be dead too. So I asked him, am I dead too? And I says, ah. and he tried to shelter me from, uh, from looking at the bed, but I was taller than him and I could see over him. And as I looked back in my bed, I saw my body laying in bed. And I realized my spirit was out, was here talking to Bruce, and my body was in bed. And I dropped down on the floor and started to sob. 
of feeling sorry for myself. And so he laughed and he picked me up. Dave, stop it, stop it. I'm not here to take care. I wanted to show you something. And I says, you're not going to take me today? I said, ah, that's up to you, but I, I'm here to show you something. And I got curious. And so he walked to uh, the closet, which was right next to our bed, pushed the uh, closet open, and stick his hand inside the, uh, the closet and separated the clothes. And when he did that, in the back of my... Uh, in the back of the closet, there was a hole. A, looked like a cave. And uh, as I peeked in and looked at the hole, uh, this hole went in and it wasn't, wasn't a straight tunnel. It was kind of like crooked and all these angles, but way at the opposite end, uh, there was a real small speck of light. And Bruce said, um, this is what I wanted to show you. And he stepped in and he looked at me, you coming? <laughs> and I said, okay, if you lead the way. So we went into this tunnel. And as we walked into it, I was looking at it. And it reminded me of a blood vessel. Um, it wasn't you know, like a tunnel in earth or anything like that, but uh, the walls seemed to be elastic and uh, could flex. In fact, when we were walking, um, it gave way, it was uh, padded. Um, but we're in there and I kept on following him. He, he was asking me questions about his children and uh, I told him about his funeral and the eulogy that his oldest son gave. And he says, oh, yeah, I remember. I I was there. And I was there. I I heard everything, and thanks. And so um, finally we reached the end of the tunnel. And by the time we reached the end of the tunnel, our clothing had changed. His blue coveralls turned into white, the white clothes, and um, as I looked on my hands and my clothes, I was dressed in the same white material. But um, this material was different. It, it made us look like birds. <laughs> I thought I was wearing feathers. But as I rubbed the feathers on uh, these things on top of me, feathers are scales. You know? And as I rubbed it, I could feel the energy kind of like buzzing through it. And... <clears throat> we came to the end of the tunnel, and at the end of the tunnel was another membrane that covered it, and it reminds me of a um, embryonic sac, where uh, you could see through it, kind of hazy, but what I saw on the other side was a world, a, a, a whole new world. Uh, there was... Uh, this tunnel opened up into a grassy place, a slight hill. There were trees, bushes, um, and flowers, and all of the colors were just vibrant and filled with life. It was really, really bright, and it stood out to me. And as I looked, I could see movement over the hill, and this movement were people. Coming towards, uh, coming towards the um, the tunnel, and as they started stepping closer, I recognized every one of the ones in front. They were my deceased relatives, my grandparents, uh, both uh, both sides. So my four grandparents were there. Uh, some of my deceased uh, uncles and aunties that I knew were there. And behind them were people I recognized in photographs uh, that were my great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, and uh, other family members. But the crowd that came over the hill just filled up the landscape. And I was uh, just in awe at the number of people. And they kept on calling my name. Uh, calling my name, you know, and inviting me to come through. 
And it, suddenly I heard barks, you know, barking dogs. And oh, what is that? And uh, over the hill came all of the dogs that I owned from the time I was a little, uh, little kid. They were my pets. Uh, dogs, pigeons, all of the animals that I cared for and loved, they came over and they ran up to the membrane and they were jumping up on the membrane trying to lick me. And I called out their names, each one of them. I still remembered their names. And I wanted to reach through the membrane and hug them. And when I saw them, I just dropped to my knees and I started crying. And all these animals are here. My loved ones are there. And so my friend Bruce kind of like stepped away for a bit to let me be by myself. And so I stood up and I looked at the membrane. And I um, everybody was saying, come, come. So I took one step into the memory. And right when I took one step in, I looked into the crowd of my ancestors, and there was my paternal grandfather, my dad's dad. He looked at me and frowned, and he went, no. And I realized my grandfather was telling me, it's not my time. And at the same time, when I felt myself pulling myself back, um, I felt my friend reach behind me, from behind me, and kind of assisting me back <laughs> through the memory. And while he's doing that, from the opposite end of the tunnel, I heard the voice of my daughter saying, Daddy, where are you? And so I uh, I backed out of the memory. I backed away and uh, I says, you know what? I cannot. I cannot go. And so he hugged me and he whispered in my ear and says, you know, I wish I had made the same decision. So he had a choice whether to step through or to turn around and go back, he made the choice to go through. And uh, so after I pulled away and uh, I felt like I was being sucked backwards and again, it's like falling backwards. And uh, suddenly I felt like I fell out of bed again. I woke up in bed. <laughs> I woke up in bed and I looked around and uh, the bed was soaking wet. Oh, wow. So my fever had broken. Mm. Yeah, my fever had broken. And so um, I couldn't, you know, I, I was better. Uh, the odd thing about it is that later when I went to check the, uh, I was curious about, okay, reality check. Would this really happen? So mm -hmm. I went and opened up the closet. And the clothes were parted. What? <laughs> the clothes oh, were parted. Oh my god! So your, your your stories have this. Oh my god! It's like they bring up every childhood nightmare ever. <laughs> After watching your NDE, I was like, okay, do I need? I mean, I I'm in an apartment too small for a closet. So it is what it is. But I do have like a space under the bed. And I know that that used to be an issue. So should I be concerned about a portal <laughs> under my bed? <laughs> nah. <laughs> but um, the, the, the funny thing is that the elementary school that I went to um, was very, very much haunted. And for whatever reason, they kept playing um, the lion, the witch in the wardrobe, the Narnia. You never heard of that before, Narnia? Yeah, uh, they yeah have, I know that. Okay, so you remember that they had that portal. Well, the wardrobe is a portal. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So when I heard your NDE, I was like, oh, my God, is that <laughs> is there a connection here? <laughs> like, what is going yeah. on? Um, but so many questions. And I mean, I are, do you have to go? Because I see you. Like, you're, are, are you okay with time? Because I have questions. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay, okay. <laughs> so um, the, the first question is... Um, uh, you you held on to Bruce. So again, was it where you you felt like you both were like physical? 
when you real people a real person wow yeah okay. for, for for me it felt like a real person I was, there was substance yeah i wasn't okay. hugging empty air okay okay and um the other um well just different thing about your experience is that most people they say they see the tunnel so that's a main thing for indies the tunnel but it's usually like a wormhole hole or a vortex your your tunnels seem to be like cavernous or like physical right is, mm -hmm. is that correct so it's very interesting yeah. i have no explanation for that do you have one i don't know <laughs> um for for me and stuff it was uh it was a living organism it seemed that we we're entering a living organism and it wasn't something um you know uh man-made or anything but it looked like we were walking into something that was living and breathing what Th this is like next level like n i i feel like something in this is something that we all should know but i have no idea what it is so i'm just going to stop here for a moment <laughs> the most so important thing that uh, people may get from this nde is that um you know a lot of people they they believe that when we die yeah we're going to be reuniting with our uh with our family members but they forget about their pets that's a family member too yeah you know so uh when i talk about the pets and stuff like that, oh, some people yeah. are more excited about meeting their pets than their family <laughs> yeah. yeah oh yeah yeah so, uh, <laughs> um okay so yes yeah, so i'm it's just very that's i just feel like there's something there you felt like you were going into it like a living breathing organism and i mean to some extent the earth is a living breathing organism that we're living on top of so i mean that's not so out of the ordinary but it's just like i i, I would love to figure that one out to me that is a puzzle to figure out um what that could be and um you said that once you got past so you, you never okay where were you at exactly so you go through the the, the uh, closet you're when you're when your clothes change into these like feather or scale like robes um you were not in the the heavenly scape past the membrane you were we're still in this tunnel still in the tunnel yeah in yeah, fact right. um every time every step that we took um when i initially stepped into the tunnel the tunnel was dark except for a light at the far end but as we continue walking the the interior got brighter and brighter and brighter and uh to the point where it was like noonday and the sun was out and uh everything was uh was visible and that's where i could actually look into the wall uh, look into the walls and uh that's why i talk about the blood vessel yeah. because uh it, it it looked like um an artery you know uh, that were in there and wow. uh, there the colors were uneven uh, it wasn't pure you know one color white or whatever it was multiple colors they were uh, there was reds there was white whites there was blue mm. and kind of like mixed, mixed up and uh, it, those colors I associate with blood mm. you know so it, it, that's why I say it looked like I was walking inside a blood vessel. Were you in? An, were you in a giant body? Were you in a giant? I think so. <laughs> Back in the being struck to the whole nother level. Like what is? That? I, I this is going to stay on my shelf. Like I have a shelf in my head where I put things I just cannot explain, and it's driving yeah. me crazy. And it's going to stay there now. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right. Um. Okay, so uh all right, blood vessel, da da da. da. Uh hmm, second. So okay, so Bruce was there for his funeral, which you know, a lot of people say that we can do that and we yeah. do do that. But he was asking you questions about his children. So uh -huh. is it that he was not able to kind of be there past that point? Like there was a point where he stopped kind of showing up and watching. Yeah, there's yeah, there was a point um for Hawaiian beliefs um the spirit will linger around their body until um until the body is buried and um there's a resting place and the spirit knows where the resting place is after that um the spirit moves on 
So um, if he had moved on, um, you know, there once in a while he'll visit the family, but it's not that he's constant. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a there's a point where the the spirit has to leave and uh, move on. So after the funeral, where the grieving and the separation and making sure that his family was cared for, um, mm -hmm. there's nothing really um, here to tether him uh, to the spleen. And uh, his his family were Mormons. And, oh, wow. uh, you know, Mormons' perception of death is really different. Um, you go to a Mormon funeral, funeral uh, it's not like a lot of other uh, where there's, you know, weeping and wailing and just carrying on and so far. Mm -hmm. In fact, a lot of the Mormon Mormon funerals that I used to go to was uh, it, it was a celebration. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And and uh, it was a celebration, and you know, uh, it was a uh, getting together of the family and so forth. Yeah. And uh, you would not want to go to a traditional Hawaiian. <laughs> the funeral because uh they have professional whalers oh boy yeah <laughs> yeah to, to cry and Aww. to cry weep and wail and mm. uh, carry on and that's the way the old Hawaiians paid respect to their you know deceased yeah. so um and it kind of kind of brings up another question that I had that I probably wasn't going to ask until this, but um, obviously it sounds like you have friends who are not Hawaiian, You're just like anybody else, like any other cool person. You have friends from all over the world, right? So, yes. it, it, from given given what you know and your in your thought, what do you think happens for because because I mean Bruce was there. So were your ancestors, you know, like, is, is, and he's clearly Mormon. He's a different religion. So how do we all come together in the afterlife when we have all these diverse, different ideas, you know? <laughs> For me, death and near-death experiences are all a psychological experience. Mm -hmm. It's our minds that's creating these things. You know, it's our minds that's uh, creating these things. So our deep roots belief, our deep rooted beliefs, and some of the beliefs that we don't know we even had or ideas will pop mm -hmm. up in these and manifest themselves during that time. Yeah. And uh, during a, this stressful time, because I tell you what, um, when you're going through the illnesses that um, and or injuries that we're going through. Uh, during the near-death experience, they're real. Your body is under stress. You know, everything is, um, your living being is being stressed. So mm -hmm. the question is, how does your mind cope with that? Mm -hmm. And for me, a lot of these near-death experiences is our uh, mental coping ability. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. everything's happening here. Everything's happening here. And, you know, my... Um, you know, occasionally and so far, like my friend reaching in and parting the clothes and, you know, leaving it there. I don't know if my, uh, my wife at the time, uh, did that, <laughs> but, uh, I checked the closet before she woke up and it yeah, was part yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 wow yeah. wow 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 yeah and then you were you were too sick to be going like physically going up uh, and doing anything okay yeah. wow and that's why i explain it to uh people from you know different cultures it's a mental process and um you really learn about yourself by examining uh these ndes mm -hmm. Um, the other question that, I mean, I, I hope I'm not repeating the same question, but it's still a question for me, so I have to ask this again, but how do you know the difference between the famili familiars or the uh, restless spirits and your actual ancestors? Like, how can somebody, if they're in this situation, because this is another NDE where you're at a space where you're seeing these 
people who look like ancestors saying, come, come, you know, come on. And it's something where you have to make the decision. It wasn't like you were in that, that heaven scape and you all, they were all just coming around you, hugging you. It was like, no, you got to pass this threshold, you know? So, uh, cause I, apparently our decision, our willpower is very important. That's one thing I've gotten from a lot of these stories and that there is that final threshold, whether it's physical, if they actually see something or they just feel like if I walk over here, I won't have a chance to come back. That happens a lot too. And it sounds like you experienced that, but how do you know? Cause now you got me paranoid. So just, just FYI, this is why this question is coming <laughs> from paranoia, right? So how do you know that the dogs and the, the ancestors, all that was not just more familiars with more power and, and ability to make mass themselves and get you into some, some really crazy situation. <laughs> it's, their, it's the name they used to call me. Okay. My ancestors and my, my close ancestors and family members know me, know me by a Hawaiian name. And they call wow. me a Hawaiian name. Mm -hmm. And for the people that are familiar with me, but they don't know me as well, and they're not my relatives or they, they're not my close friends, mm -hmm. they know me by a different name. Wow. So uh, my given name is my, uh, my given name is David John. Okay. If a spirit calls me only David, that's not a person that knows me that well. Mm. If a person calls me David John, then I begin to listen to them because it shows them that they're familiar. They know who I am. They know my background. You, they probably, uh, you know, someone I knew from the time I was little. Mm. Okay. If you call me by my Hawaiian name, that's family. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I've heard something like this before in an NDE where the, the person was, uh, the spirit was calling them by the name that they were given at birth. Like it, it, they had, they had taken another name after that and they were calling them by that name. And it was so weird. Um, so I've definitely heard that before, but for people who don't have nicknames or Hawaiian names or special names and, and passcodes, <laughs> how do they, cause I've heard other experiences where people who look very much like like an actual grand um, well the person's grandparent so an actual ancestor came into the hospital room saying come with us but they got a weird feeling about them and didn't go and realize you know that they turned into demons and they realized that was wrong but then saw that same ancestor that same grandparent in another part of the NDE later and then felt like oh this is really grandpa and it was went to him and it was no problem so just for people watching who are just like, okay, how do I know what's what when I'm in that situation? How, what would you say besides knowing a name that they could pick up on? Is it energy <laughs> feeling? Is it? There's, there's a second test that my family uh, use and uh, where we pick this up, I'm not sure. But if we run into someone that uh, calls me David John, a spirit calls me David John and we start um, you know, a conversation. And I want to know if this messenger is a true messenger or not. I extend out my hand to shake their hand. If they reach out and grab and you feel nothing, says bye. <laughs> wow. You're not, you're not sent by God. You're not sent by my ancestors. If, however, the spirit says, um, you know, David John, um, I cannot shake your hand because I'm spirit. That's the truthful one. They're telling the truth. So it's worthwhile to listen to them. Yeah. I, I think <laughs> asking questions for sure. And like you said, just maybe you're saying, are you sent? There's the one guy who says, always ask, are you sent by the one and infinite creator? Like, are you of God? Is what he would say. Yeah. And um, I just hope people are you know, because we never know when we go or when we're going to half go or, you know, partially go. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully <laughs> they're listening and they have some tips. They start making some ideas of what they should do. Okay. Um, let me see what other questions. Now, what, why do you think Bruce felt or was wondering, saying that he wished that he hadn't gone? Like, I mean, it seems like it's a great place over there. You know, from what I've heard, heaven seems awesome. Yeah. So why he do you think a, he, he had a, 
I think he had a choice of, um, you know, staying on Earth. Uh, but I think, um, I think he had had he stayed on Earth, he would be more of a burden to his family because uh, he had a massive stroke. Oh, yeah. And if he survived this, he would be paralyzed. And so, um, you know, his wife and his kids would have to take care of him. And the kids were still young. His oldest one was uh, barely 11 you know, at the time. And so you're talking about taking care of a paralyzed dad um, for all that time. And the wife would be you know, caught, uh, caught with that. He regrets it because uh, it's time that he missed it. Yeah, yeah. He couldn't see his children growing up being parents themselves holding his grandbabies yeah so all of those are missed opportunities and i think the last question i have for this in the e was uh oh when your daughter said daddy where are you so do you think that did she ask you know actually say that or do you think it was more for spirit you know, because you might have been sleeping at the time, I'm assuming. <laughs> yeah. Uh, for me, it was more of, um, you know, more of her spirit calling. Or um, if it could have been one of my ancestors mimicking her voice, saying, hey, <laughs> look back, you got things to take care of here, you know? Yes, yeah. <laughs> it, it just, it amazes me, the power of spirit. It really does. Because, like, you hear so many of these stories where they can imitate you know visually what you know something else and and sure. mimic voices and i mean if people were smarter we'd be putting a lot more attention into these ndes into spiritual matters because we all leave we're not staying here we stay here it'll be another point i'm like why am i i don't care about ndes i don't care about the spirit but we don't stay here we all leave yeah. <laughs> we should probably <laughs> we should probably think about where are we going <laughs> yeah yeah. All right, so that that's the questions I have for that. And I I am known for asking so many questions. Like I would literally have you where you felt that you were being kidnapped and tortured. So I'm just gonna allow it to just be this, the, the two in NDEs. And uh, let me see if I have any of the other basic questions. Uh, Cause you, you spoke a lot, or you answered this question. You spoke a lot about your paranormal um, powers before and after uh, the, the experience. Are there any that you have not mentioned? Like, are there any other, uh, you know, like psychic abilities or things like that that you have? Um, and I'm assuming that unlike other NDEs, it didn't come from the experience because it sounds like you had all this before. Is that correct? Or you think it happened after the NDE, the first one? Actually, the, um, before the near-death experiences uh, at five, um, I already started having prophetic dreams where I would get, get I have dreams and see things happening um, that would happen within three, four days, you know. And so the turnaround point would be about three to four days. And, or I have strong feeling about something and it happens, you know. And uh, so that was part of it. Um, what uh, developed, after my first near-death experience was um, the ability to see spirits. I couldn't see spirits before that. and um, But after my first near-death experience, I could see spirits. And by seeing them and attempting to communicate with them, I eventually developed uh, the ability to communicate with them telepathically first. And then... Uh, queuing in to the right frequency so I could hear them speak. But uh, it's not something where a snap it happened. It took time to develop. And uh, after my near second, uh, after my first near death experience, I could also um, see things that people were trying to hide from me. Mm. You put something in a novel, <laughs> try and lock things away from me. Mm. Uh, you know, the harder you try and hide things from me, the easier it is for me to figure it out. Mm. <laughs> uh, you wrap up things in a in a uh, in a gift, 
uh, Christmas time, especially, and mm. uh, put it under the tree for me. I know what's in there already if I just focus and look at it. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm glad you're mentioning this because um, this goes along with what we were talking about initially about the powers or innate powers we have that nobody's really, really focusing on or, or you know, um, yeah. building up. But um, as a child, besides some of the psychic things that I had, I always remember this one time that my teacher had a full a thing full of Tootsie Rolls. And I was I was a I was a little fat girl. So when I saw the whole thing of Tootsie Rolls, I was like, I want to win that. And he was like, if you can <laughs> if, that, if you can picture the, the exact number of how many Tootsie Rolls are in here, you get it. I focused, focus, focus, focus. This whole thing is about focus, right? Yeah. We all uh -huh. put our, our our number down. We give it to the teacher, and then at the end of the week or the month, whatever, he comes and says who got closest to the number. My teacher looked so scared, like scared, for like the whole day that it was time for him to tell who won. And he said that I had won, but I had gotten the exact number of tipsy <laughs> rolls in <Awesome>. that jar, <laughs> and I was just eating them like, oh yeah. <laughs> now if I could just do that with the lottery numbers, <laughs> I might have a life. <laughs> oh my well, god! Well, you talk about the lottery. <laughs> Wait, let me see. Oh wow! Okay, okay. Is, is this the is this the winning hand? Is this how we get it? Well, <laughs> <this> no. <laughs> Um, what I'm showing you is that um, out of the three numbers, out of the three numbers that uh, was pulled, I identified all three. I didn't get them in the order, though. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but very close, very close. Pretty soon, right? <laughs> the next one. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I, I like the idea that people just need to understand that we have to focus. We have to really start yeah. practicing focus. And also, um, I've heard this so many times. I've read this in books, especially with, oh, goes into a question. ETs, have you had any experience or do you believe in, all, you know, extraterrestrials, multidimensionals, all that good stuff? <laughs> well, I have a experience when I was a policeman on Molokai where I have um, 20 minutes of lost time. And oh. it, uh, before... The last time I was at a pier, and we there was a report of um, strange lights that was uh, flashing between the island of Molokai, Lanai, and Maui. So there's three islands, and there's a body of water between um, these three islands, and people were reporting strange lights. And so I went down to the pier on Molokai, and I started looking at it. And uh, there are lights going zooming all around the place. So it's crazy. Mm. And some of uh, there's this one huge um, triangular shaped uh, thing up in the air and stuff, and uh, moving through. I could see the shadow moving, and then it lit up, and it wow. came directly towards us. Uh, towards me, and it was about um, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. Uh, nobody was there, and this uh, object came flying uh, directly over me. Then uh, the next thing I, I was standing in front of my patrol car, and the next thing I know, I'm sitting on my patrol car, and my radio is going off asking five one where are you five one come in and so i call back and i said hey, I, i'm here at the pier why he says we've been trying to call you <laughs> oh says, my goodness standing here so what time is it now and it gave me the time i says no it's not <laughs> and, oh my god uh, there's there's a 20 minute discrepancy so for what happened in that 20 minutes, I don't know. Oh my goodness. <sighs> I I I, I took my body for anything and <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> but I, I recently had a, a very weird situation. Like I haven't really told too many people, but it's enough for me to be concerned because I don't really trust the Greys. Like I've heard enough stories to think that they might they're, I've heard that they're artificial, but I don't think that positive aliens are sending the grace, right? 
just my own belief, right? But I woke up after watching, you know, a podcast on NDEs, and I feel like you got to be very careful about what you watch and what you consume because I felt like there was there was something, some kind of portal in this particular video, right? Uh -huh. I went to sleep, I wake up, and I see these tall white grays around my bed, yes. and. I immediately, I still don't know if it was my power or if it was something protecting me, but it's like I, a whole force just smashed them out. Like they were gone, like boom, gone, right? And, but it was enough to make, really make me go, what the heck? Because I have never had an experience like that before, you know, never that, you know, I, I don't know that I've had any extraterrestrial type experiences. I believe in it. I've always believed in that because it just makes perfect sense that we're not the only ones here, you know? But to actually have them in my space, I was like, how? How did you get here? <laughs> they didn't last long, but how did you get in? <laughs> so again, I, you know, thank God for protection. Because um, again, I don't know if it was my own innate thing. I just don't know how, if I did it and didn't realize I had that power or if it was something that just, whatever it was, was powerful. And it said, bye, get out, <laughs> get out. Um, you know, actually, when I look back in time uh, to that, experience um the one thing i can say is that uh, from that moment in time my perception of things around me um and my abilities were enhanced mm. i mean they became more pronounced and more uh more accurate and uh it took me a while to realize that uh, perhaps, you know, somebody grabbed me and say, we need to fix this screw in this guy. <laughs> and now, it's see, part of, loose. <laughs> a, little, a loose screw here. But um, part of me also did think about it sometime later. And I said, what if they were coming to, to help? You know, like a little part of me said that. But on the same token, I'm like, I need you to call me two weeks in advance. I need to put it in my calendar. You don't just show up in my bedroom. No, no, no. Because <laughs> that's what happens when you just show up. Just FYI. <laughs> and they should know me enough to know that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, all right. But uh, so, okay, I'm going to start closing this down. All right. So start with what is your message you want to share with anyone who sees this video? Well, um you know, for for one thing and so far, we, we need to realize that we're spiritual beings. And as spiritual beings, uh, we have powers uh, beyond our imagination. And we're only limited uh, by our imagination and by our wills. And so the more we allow our imaginations to exercise and the more we expand our abilities uh, will be able to um you know manifest things and do things that um you know actually would have uh, been been pretty awesome <laughs> you know <laughs> but <clears throat> a lot of the things that um you know the abilities that i that i've uh, developed over the time the one uh the main focus is to help other people. And the more focus, uh, the more I'm focused on helping other people using my abilities, uh, the more I am given. So it's not all about you. It's mm -hmm. how it can, um, you know, you enhance the ability to help others. Okay. So uh, focus on that instead of just trying to develop yourself. How can I help others? And the gifts will come, okay? And um, that's where I function from. How can I help other people, all right? So that's the first part. Second? <laughs> oh, the second is just uh, tell people what are you you know doing now, the name of any books that you have, and how they can contact you. Sure. Um, right now, what I'm doing, uh, there's... A lot of projects that I'm working on, <laughs> and uh, I'm a healer, and I just got through working with a group of uh, First Nations from Canada, and they were healers, and they've been, uh, they're here for about 10 days, and I had three days working on workshops with them, expanding their 
intuition, learning how to use their minds in, in different ways. And uh, it's interesting working with, uh, with other people <clears throat> because um, when you read some of the, my books and some of my adventures that I have, uh, it seems like a fairy tale. But when you get to sit in my workshop and I get to uh, display my abilities, it's not a fairy tale anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. mm -hmm. um, I do things with cards that uh, people are blown away. It says, Dave, how can you read a card? Um, I says, well, all cards, uh, everything in, in the universe is alive. But it's a card. Well, if you think it's dead and it's not going to communicate, you're right to you. But for me, everything is living and it wants to communicate with me. And I open that communication with my deck of cards. I said, and it's not only in my deck of cards, but let me borrow yours. And this uh, one lady was there, just like, prove it to me. So I said, okay, shuffle the cards and give me. And I, um, and I asked her, what? show me the color on the top of the deck. And she says, it's black. I says, no, it's not. It's red. How do you know? It's not only red, but it's sharp. It's poking my hands when I touch it. So it's a red diamond. Really? Say, so, yeah. And I close your eyes. What are you doing now? I says, I counting the spots on the cards. There's seven of them. What? So now turn over the card. Seven of diamonds. <laughs> oh. So now it's no no longer reading something about my adventures in a book, but you got to see, right? Mm. <laughs> so um, those are the kind of workshops that I put on, and um, you know, I teach people how to uh, how to communicate with uh, the environment and things around them, uh, to read uh, to read things uh, within the environment. That's one part of that. I'm also re a remote viewer, and as a remote viewer, I use my skills in predicting sporting events. Uh, the rise and fall of the value of stocks. I needed um, you in my life when I used to do FanDuel. <laughs> and uh, the biggest challenge that uh, I have is, uh, you know, working on the lottery, which is the, the major lotteries, the Powerball and the, the Mega Million. Um, mm -hmm. It's getting there. Uh, the smaller lotteries, like the pick three, uh, we've won that several times, so mm. <laughs> uh, it seems to be the easiest ones to go after. Yeah. So um, that's all energy work and uh, using my abilities. And finally, I'm a writer. Uh, I'm an author. Um, I'm, I just uh, put my brand new series uh, on Amazon. And the brand new series is called Hawaiian Shapeshifters. And uh, book number one is called A, uh, a Man Eater is Born. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so A Man Eater is Born. And it's on uh, Amazon pre-order right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but... Here in Hawaii, uh, we have shapeshifters that's part of our genealogy. Mm -hmm. uh, a shapeshifter that was part of my family uh, was an eel. Uh, while he was on land, he was a tall uh, human. When he mm -hmm. jumped into the water, he turned into an eel, a wow. great eel. And he's one of the family protectors. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what I'm writing about uh, and this is a work of fiction, so uh, it, it involves uh, a lot of different shape-shifting, uh, shape-shifters that we have in Hawaiian, uh, Hawaiian legend, mm -hmm. but it's modernizing it and taking it to today's society. Uh, as uh, the question that I ask is, 
if the shapeshifters were alive today and part of our society, what kind of challenges would they face, you know, yeah. and how would they live among us? <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't imagine them having challenges. They have one up on us, you know, <laughs> but um, I, I would love to see more Hawaiian um, type, you know, we have Moana that, you know, all of my nieces have their birthday party was Moana yeah. thing. Like I yeah. even like, I, I didn't want to wear it because this is kind of messed, you know, whatever, but I have millions of these because of all these parties. <laughs> <laughs> like and, and hula hula skirts, but um, I would love to see more of the indigenous Hawaiian um, you know, beliefs like brought into the mainstream, you know, more. That would be awesome. Yeah, well, that's why I started um the Hawaiian shapeshifters um uh, genre. Basically, it's a relatively new genre because um a lot of the shapeshifting uh, stories out there are either werewolf or vampire, right? Mm-hmm skinwalkers yeah. and so um here in the polynesia we have our own traditions of uh shapeshifters we call kupua they were demigods that were placed among uh hawaiians and uh their gifts from the gods with specific skills uh to help people and some of them use those skills uh you know really good in, in a mm -hmm. good way yeah. Uh, Maui is one of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Familiar with Moana. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Maui is a shapeshifter. Yeah. And, um, but we also have some other shapeshifters that were destructive and they became curses. Yeah. For the people. Yeah. Yeah. So in, in my series, I would be exploring both sides. Yeah. I can see that becoming, I can see that becoming mainstream because like you said, we have the werewolves and the vampires and that was a whole big craze. It's always a craze. It's never ending because I think yeah. that people, people realize this truth in these stories. Yeah. Well, in the Caribbean, uh, what I found out is in the Caribbean, they have very similar shapeshifters as us here in Hawaii because they're ocean. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I might have some Caribbean in me. I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I know I, I know I feel like there's a lot of truth in all of this and I just I'm really excited I hope people pick up that book and and really learn about this and um I could see it becoming a lot of your work too I could even see you making like a children's book series because so many of your experiences are kind of tied to that the empowerment of the kids and you know like you know monsters in the closet or you know portals in the closet <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> things like that but I could I could really see somebody taking this um information here and creating a, like a more like a spiritual children's book series or something about how to protect themselves and who to trust and this and you know I don't know maybe that's just my imagination <laughs> but um yeah. But yeah and and can people so if people want to uh join those workshops do you provide it on zoom as well like can they access that through your yes, website all of, yes all of my classes are offered in a zoom mm -hmm. uh, the best way to contact uh, the best way to contact me is on uh, Facebook. Okay. And Facebook, and um, I, on Facebook, I'm Kahu Dave. So two separate words, Kahu, K-A-H-U, mm -hmm. and Dave, D-A-V-E. -E. Okay. So uh, if you, people want to contact me, that's the easiest way to uh, get in touch with me on on Facebook, um, send me a uh, send me a friend uh, friend advice uh, invite Request, or yeah. just jump on a page and start, uh, leave me a message. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. All right. So we'll we'll close it up there. I mean, we definitely got to. I got to ask a lot of the questions that I had um, that were just keeping <laughs> me awake, and it added even more questions to put in my on my shelf, my mental shelf to worry about. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Um, You're welcome. And I learned a lot more about Hawaiian culture and um, the religion. And it's just, I think this was great all around. Um, so I'm going to close it here. I'm going to say we thank you for your courage and sharing your experience in a time when the world is still mostly sleeping and don't yet understand that we are so much more than these bodies. Um, I surround you, dear brother Dave, David. <laughs> Thank David you. John, <laughs> um, in divine in divine love and divine light um, to guide you for the rest of your earthly experience. And I thank you. <laughs>
Oh. Bless you. <laughs> All right. Bye, David. Aloha. <laughs> okay.